All right. So, um, fluorescence. So I added a little bit on CDOM because I wasn't sure until I saw Ken's lecture last night or the other day. Um, but I added a little bit on CDOM as well. So we'll talk about fluorescence. Um, so I think we're going to talk, we'll talk a little bit about what it is, who does it. Um, so a little bit on the physics of fluorescence. And then we'll talk about fluorescence as a proxy. And we'll have to think about it um, in some aspects on physiology and how that impacts fluorescence. And so we'll talk about what happens when you measure fluorescence in vitro, which is in a test tube, in vivo, which is in a cell, and in situ, which is sort of in the location of which you're measuring. And so that would be in the ocean. But then we'll talk about that scary word called validation. So what does fluorescence actually mean? And can you validate what that signal is? And then we'll, if we have time, we'll talk about, given all the sources of variability that we find in the fluorescence signal, what can we interpret and what fun things can we figure out about phytoplankton? Um, and I would just mention that fluorescence has been measured in the ocean since the 1960s. And it was just hailed as this like, amazing thing because it's so sensitive that um, you don't need much chlorophyll in the water to fluoresce to get a signal. And so the fact that they could measure fluorescence from boats um, just really changed the way biologists looked at the distribution and concentration of phytoplankton. Um, and there was this period of acceptance where it was just like, oh, this is the greatest thing. And then now there's a lot of renewed interest in exploring the variability now that we understand that not all the variability that we measured can be attributed to concentration, but is attributed to, to other processes. But as Ivana mentioned, every time your signal has some source of variability that you're trying to get rid of, what you're trying to get rid of is actually an opportunity to learn something else about the world. And so fluorescence is really one of the perfect examples of this approach. So, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so fluorescence is a property of a molecule um, to, that absorbs energy to re-emit that energy at a longer wavelength. Um, and in the ocean, we primarily think about fluorescence by chlorophyll A. Um, that happens in the red. Phycoerythrin fluoresces in the orange. And also CDOM, the color dissolved organic matter, fluoresces somewhere in the blue and green. So, okay, so here's some pretty pictures. I went back to my diagram here. I'm going to show you a bunch of different ways. <laughs> so here's some pretty pictures. These are vials of, um, that's actually spinach extract in a cryo vial under light microscope. If we had it in a beaker, it might look like this. And then when you um, put it under UV light or blue light, you can see the fluorescence here. It's really intense because it's so thick. It almost looks like blood, right? Um, we actually did this demonstration for um, the public when I was, um, in France at the at the, um, uh, the marine optics lab in Villefranche. And they didn't know where to put me because my French isn't that good. And so they put me in the fluorescence uh, station because chlorophyll and fluorescence and all these words are kind of the same in English and in French. So I spent the afternoon describing fluorescence. It was really fun, but boy, was I exhausted by the end. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, everyone can. Everyone can appreciate that sort of a demonstration. Uh, so here's some images, some light micrographs of a, that's of a diatom. And you can see the, the different cells and I want to show lots of beautiful pictures of phytoplankton. And you can see the chloroplast here. This is what a mixture of diatoms looks like under an epifluorescence microscope, where what you see is the fluorescence by the chlorophyll that's, that is in the chloroplast. And it really is pretty stunning here to see the individual structures. Um, so that's enough of pretty pictures. Okay, so let's talk about what fluorescence is. So we have to go back to the molecular structure of chlorophyll. And really, if you look at this molecule, we've got this pyrrole ring with all of these double bonds there. And that's called the conjugated, the conjugated double bonds. And um, that is the area of the molecule that is responsible for both absorption and fluorescence. And so there's a nice resonance that goes on with these double bonds. And it turns out um, 
that that not only is responsible for the strong absorption, it happens to be that it, it leads to the absorption um, in the visible and a little bit into the ultraviolet. Um, and you get this, this, remember we talked about dipole oscillations and that was what was responsible for absorption. That's where that is occurring. And um, the amount of resonance that happens, the dipole resonance that happens, that is what determines the strength of the absorption. So as the number of double bonds increases in a molecule, that increases the wavelength of absorption. So it absorbs longer wavelengths, which is kind of counterintuitive to me. So I always have to double, double think about that. So there are people who are looking at how, like where in the molecule it's absorbing blue light compared to where it's absorbing red light. And the, the, there's, some people have suggested that the direction in which red light approaches the molecule compared to blue light um, will interact with more or uh, fewer or greater double bonds for this resonance, and that's what gives you these two peaks in absorption. But, um, yeah, and so I have the picture there, right, the, the two peaks, right? So that gives you this very strong absorption in the blue and this very strong absorption in the red, and then there's some vibrational, the vibrational peaks, so that was just a review. So what happens? Well, we've got, and so now I'm showing just the absorption part of this, this is the energy level diagram. We've got absorption to the higher energy um, uh, level, absorption to the lower energy level. Those are your two peaks in chlorophyll, the two electronic states. We've got all the vibrational states, three of them, or actually two extra ones in the blue, three extra ones in the red. Okay, so there's absorption. And now you've got all this energy in these higher electronic states. Okay? So what's going to happen? Well, the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to get some heat loss in the molecule. And this is what we think is happening in the Raman too, right? Like all of that energy that's lost to that vibrational level has to be going and heating the molecule. And in fact, I will say that there was a guy, who was the guy who measured absorption, ba or absorption based on heat? Um, well, there's, there's yeah, but they were trying... Maybe, they were measuring heat of the, the, the amount of heat change in molecules to reconstruct an absorption I'm spectrum. Yeah, I can't think of... There's, there's two things. There's one, the photo... Photoacoustics. Photoacoustics. Um, photoacoustics. That's the guy who's was on trial, but then also Fry, and, and actually it was first... Um, what's his name? I can oh, see uh, his face, yeah. <laughs> Listen, yeah, yeah. Um, which anyway, it's an aside. Anyway, okay, so what happens? So first we can get some heat loss from these higher vibrational levels down to the ground state of each electronic level. So it happens here where we lose some heat down here, and we also are losing heat at the lower electronic, excited electronic state from these different vibrational levels from which we've absorbed, right? So that's all going into heat and if, it's, if the chlorophyll is in a phytoplankton, in a thylakoid, that heat is heating the thylakoid membrane, right? So that's actual heat in a living system. Um, you can also go from the equivalent of the, the blue peak to the red peak worth of energy, the difference in energy between those two electronic states, which is a lot of energy, that can also go to heat. So that means we can go from this excited state down to this excited state through the loss of heat. Okay. And then finally, we can also um, de-excite this first electronic um, excited state down to the ground level, and that's an awful lot of heat. Okay. So this is all happening in the cell, and the cell is not psyched about this because heat if it accumulates, can denature proteins and, and cook the cell. So keeping track of heat um, as a way of getting rid of excess absorbed energy that hasn't gone into photosynthesis can be a concern to the cell. And so the cell doesn't want to lose all of that energy as heat. And fluorescence is a byproduct of this, or um, an alternate pathway by which cells can get, or chlorophyll can get rid of this excess energy in a way that is not damaging to the cell.
And so fluorescence is actually a preferred pathway for de-excitation for cells that have absorbed too much energy for photosynthesis when the photosynthesis system gets backed up. So what happens now is we're at this, um, we're now at this ground state of the first um, electronic state, the equivalent of the red peak worth of energy. And instead of losing it as heat, it can be re-emitted as a photon. And then just um, fluoresces away from the, c from the cell or from the molecule. It can also emit a photon down to the top vibrational level, oops, or you know the next levels. And so what you see here is um, most of the energy, the de-excitation occurred at this peak, which is slightly shifted to the red of the absorption peak, right? And so um, it turns out that potentially the, the absorption peak, the maximum, was maybe associated with this arrow, which was at the second vibrational level. And so this will be a slightly... Are you playing on the internet while I'm talking? <laughs> so you know what I do to my students who do that in my class? I take away their electronic devices and they have to come to my office to get them back. <laughs> um, so if you see the de-excitation to the higher vibrational level, that's associated with a little bit lower energy, right? It's a lower band here and that's this peak out here. And so you can see that as you have uh, vibrational levels in absorption, you have vibrational levels in re-emission. And that's why you tend to get a mirror image of fluorescence emission compared to absorption. So it's just some kind of fun physics. So, okay. So then let's think about what emission and excitation mean. So here is a spectrum, two spectra, one spectrum of absorption, which is in blue, and this is chlorophyll in an extract. So very strong blue peak, lower red peak, and then on a different arbitrary unit axis, um, because it's difficult to quantify um, actual uh, photons, this is the emission spectrum for chlorophyll. Okay, so if we're going to measure this, if we want to measure an excitation spectrum, the blue one, what we do is we put our sample in a fluorometer and we monitor the intensity of fluorescence at one wavelength. So you're going to pick a wavelength. So we could pick the peak of the fluorescence emission. We could maybe pick the second vibrational level. But we're going to keep our detector on that so there's a filter in front of it and we're just measuring the photons that are emitted from this molecule. And then you scan you, you um, allow light of different wavelengths to pass through your sample. And so as you maybe allow 400 nanometer light, you measure the intensity of fluorescence. Not the intensity, the magnitude of fluorescence. Yeah. I'm looking at you, Kurt. <laughs> this is one of those battles. It's not I am, I'm doing it though, I took it, out of, I took it out of my slides. Every time I, had, I did a scan for intensity, okay. Then, if you go to 430 nanometer light, you're going to measure the magnitude of fluorescence. And it's going to be bigger because the absorption at that wavelength is stronger. Okay? And so, more energy in, you'll get more energy out. And so, while this looks like an absorption spectrum, it actually isn't. It's an excitation spectrum. For a molecule like chlorophyll in a solvent, the absorption spectrum and the excitation spectrum are the same. In vitro. In vitro, yes. And not in vitro, everything I've said is off, okay? But that's how you measure an excitation spectrum. And so essentially it's telling you where in the spectrum and how much um, does this molecule absorb and then convert that energy into fluorescence? Okay? Yeah? Are we just talking about chlorophyll? Right now, right now, chlorophyll A. Yes. Okay? And you're going to do this in the lab. <laughs> 
as of an hour ago. I got it working. Okay, then <laughs> in the emission spectrum, if we wanted to make this red curve or figure out what it was, what we would do is put our sample in the chamber and we would excite it with a wavelength of light that we know it absorbs efficiently that results in emission. So in this case, we might excite it at 430 and then we would scan the light that's emitted on the other side. So you have light coming in and light going out and you can change the excitation wavelength, you can change the emission wavelength, but you can't do it at the same time. Or you can, but it'd be a pain in the neck to try to deconvolve. So when we see, so if you're giving it the same amount of energy and you can see that there's this big peak and then a lower peak, that says that for the amount of absorbed energy, um, we have preferential emission from that range of vibration and higher excited state down to the ground state. There's preferential release of energy here and there's a lower amount from this vibrational level. Okay. Um, and as I said when Ken was talking, you have to be really careful about how you quantify both the excitation and the emission because as you're scanning a lamp to allow energy into your sample, you want to make sure that the amount of energy that you excited the sample with it this wavelength is the same as the energy that you excited it with at this wavelength. So that you can say that there's a difference between this peak and that peak. And so that's a little bit um, tricky to do. And then also you want to ensure that when you're detecting the fluoresced energy, that the detector can is equally sensitive to light at this wavelength compared to this wavelength. Okay. All right, questions on that? Yes, they are as long as there is no absorption by anything other than the molecule. So as long as it's a molecule of chlorophyll, those are the same. And in fact, what people do, because this is such a difficult thing to do, they measure the absorption spectrum and then measure the excitation spectrum and they use that to create their correction. The magnitude, okay, so if you have more molecules, you'll get higher fluorescence because you'll get higher absorption, right? Is that your question? If you give them more light, you'll get more fluorescence. So if the intensity, if the magnitude, actually if the intensity of your lamp changes, you can artificially change the um, height of the fluorescence and it's not because um, this part is higher than this part. It's because you gave them more energy when you were, you know, where you were scanning. It depends. So, so this whole magnitude could go up and down as the lamp went up and down. And there is no minimum limit from where it's starting to fluoresce? No. No. Mm -hmm. I think one photon in, one photon out. I'm hiding from Kurt. Photon. Mm -hmm. what packet of quantized energy. Yeah. But there's an yeah, there's an efficiency as long as you've accounted for the other loss terms, like say if it was in a cell, photosynthesis or heat, because you can still get that total de-excitation with heat as well. Yeah. Okay, so here's some examples of excitation and emission spectra for chlorophyll and for phycoerythrin. So it has a really broad absorption or excitation and its emission is in the orange and it also has a second vibrational level. CDOM is really complicated um, because it's a complex molecule, I'll show you in a second, but it's got an absorption that looks, you know, exponential, that's a model, but I could have put a measurement there. And its emission can have multiple peaks depending upon its composition. So here's one with a peak around 300 nanometers and then here's one out in the 400. So in this case, because the excitation wavelength was around 250, this emission 
um, is in the blue. So you can get, if you had UV light shining on the ocean, you could have blue fluorescence by CDOM. Uh, and then here is something, if you had a water sample that had both CDOM and chlorophyll in it, you can see the emission by CDOM, emission by chlorophyll, and here's the, the Raman peak on top of it. And so what people do is they deconvolve this whole signal into contributions by whatever else is in there. Okay, that's usually what it looks like. You do a regular number. So... Um, how does the emission spectrum vary as the excitation varies? So that means yes. Are those emissions, those emission spectra are for some light source? Are they for like? For what? Those emission spectra on the previous slide are for a single light. excitation. So this particular emission spectrum was generated from an excitation at 250 nanometers. Yeah, it's more complicated when it's white light coming in. Right, you can imagine that for each wavelength coming in, you have some comparable spectrum. Now, of course, that's my next question, is if I've got, who left the messy board? <laughs> that's okay. So if I have this emission as a function of wavelength for chlorophyll, and I excite it at 440, and I get this curve, what's going to happen when I excite it at, say, 410? Just because I know it has an absorption there, but the absorption is lower. Say that's 440. Say that's 410. What's the emission going to look like if I excite it here? Yes. Same shape and lower magnitude. Same shape and lower magnitude. Um, shifted this side, lower magnitude. Shifted this side? Slightly and lower magnitude. OK, so something like that versus, ooh, wow, <laughs> I like tons, and now there's pieces. What do you think? Does everyone agree that it'll be a lower magnitude? Yeah. What do you think? If it's 410, there's less absorption. So there's less energy going into the molecule. So there'll be less energy emitted. OK? So I agree with you. It's lower. But then the question is, does the shape or does the emission spectrum vary? depending upon its excitation. You say no, why not? Because the, the structure of the molecule is the same and it has the same resonance. Exactly. So the difference in the energy of the electronic states does not change. And so the emission does not change, just the magnitude will change for chlorophyll. Yeah, so that is actually great, and that's why fluorometers work, because they can constantly monitor this emission peak and excite it with whatever color they decide to excite it with. Now, that is not true. We're going to talk about CDOM. Okay, what? Uh, I mean, it's, in, in cells, it's even more complex. Yes. So for a single compound, it's constant, the emission spectrum. But for something complex like CDOM, where it's not a single molecule that's absorbing and fluorescing, it's a suite of compounds 
it, that's not, that isn't the case. And so here's an example from Wunsch. Um, these are all of these different uh, organic molecules that have uh, conjugated ring structures and therefore of strong absorption and strong fluorescence. You notice that compared to the chlorophyll molecule, it has fewer conjugated double bonds. That's why it absorbs at the higher energy or shorter wavelengths. This is from 250 to 600 in each case. The red curve is the absorption spectrum or excitation spectrum for that molecule. Actually, it's the excitation. And the dashed line here is the emission spectrum. So if you had an ocean filled with this, then you would have this absorption spectrum and this emission spectrum. But we don't. We tend to have all of this. And that's why when you add up varying composition of organic matter, you end up with, you know, by, if you add these all together, you end up with some exponential absorption for CDOM soup. And you get um, emission spectra that can be very peaked very short wavelength or peaked in the very long wavelength. And so depending upon the light that you excite it with, the emission spectrum is going to be some composite. <coughs> Bless you. And so what we tend to see is the longer and longer the wavelength, the longer and longer the peak emission. And so that's part of what makes CDOM fluorescence complicated. Yeah. So any molecule with double bonds in a ring like that will can fluoresce. fluoresce. Can yeah. Fluoresce. Yeah. And I don't know the constraints by which certain ones don't. Maybe it's just that there's other, the way that they are, um, you know, uh, put together or um, bonded to other material so can change like it. Structure yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and it turns out that the double, the double conjugated double bonds and rings also um, are what make certain molecules yummy to bacteria, too. So you can look at the degradation of fluorescence as a proxy for bacterial breakdown. Also, photooxidation changes the double bonds. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. For fluorometer, the incoming light, so you set it for 40, and then you look at the absorption spectrum. What about the light that doesn't interact? Like, does it just not look at the 440 wavelength? What? Well, when you're looking at the absorption spectra of when you excite at 440 nanometers. So I've, I'm, I know that my molecule absorbs at 440. Yeah. And so if I only shine 440 on my sample, I know that I'm going to get some emission. But this is the emission. Yeah, so this is. There's no emission at 440. There's not? No, the emission's at 680 okay, and 710. Okay. About, yeah. Yeah, and so you're shining blue light. You're losing the difference between 440 and 680 as heat. All that gets lost is heat. Oh, because that's where the back Yeah, is. and then you get the emission out here. Yeah, and I could also excite it with this color, and it will um, stimulate fluorescence, not shorter fluorescence. Yeah, I think it depends. There's some weird anti-Stokes things that can happen here, mm -hmm. but it's um, it, you can you can make it happen in solution um, and under controlled temperature. That's but they are so close to yeah, and you can get the other thing is is that if you have this absorb this fluorescence emission here, but you have an absorption, the absorption can absorb that part. Which then, if you, if that if that disappears, then the residual spectrum is going to be shifted. The peak might look like it's shifted because of reabsorption. Yeah. So when you're doing it, you tend to not excite in the red and measure in the red. You tend to excite in the blue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when they absorb and then fluoresce, there's lost yes. into the cell. Yeah, so in this case, heat is lost into the suspension. Right. 
but if it's in a cell, there's heat lost in the chloroplast. Mm -hmm. And so you also showed us that they can absorb at a wavelength and then not fluoresce and lose that directly as heat yes. as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's preferential for them to fluoresce instead. Is that is heat because less? I yes, think? because that e equivalent energy the equivalent so energy of put, this yeah. goes into heat versus goes into light that leaves the cell okay. and goes into heating the water around them because right. it gets absorbed by water. So they'd rather make the photon. They'd rather, rather make the photon, it. yeah. It's still a photon, right? but it's just like a heat. Like if they lose it as heat, that's like a... It stays in the cell. Right, okay. okay. Yeah, and can damage the molecules. It can actually break the bonds. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The second peak is around 710? About, yeah, it depends on if it's in, if it's in, you know, acetone or methanol or ether or if it's in a cell. You can actually resolve this from remote sensing reflectance because in that case the sun is the stimulator, phytoplankton are the absorber, and the emission is happening out of the whole cell into the ocean, and you can actually measure that red light. You see it in your reflectance spectra. And so you can resolve these two peaks. I'll show you that. I don't know. Is it Friday? Sometime. Sometime in the next two and a half weeks. Yeah. OK. So let's talk about what's moving beyond in vitro but into in vivo and in situ. OK. So. Chlorophyll fluorescence is a proxy for chlorophyll concentration. That's why we did it in the lab, right? With Ivana, you guys extracted chlorophyll, you measured the intensity of fluorescence, and that was related to the chlorophyll concentration. Um, it's sort of a long chain of proxies. I just want to make sure that people are aware because they, people often say, oh, it's a proxy for phytoplankton biomass, but that means in your head, the signal strength of fluorescence is a proxy for the chlorophyll concentration that you measure in extract. It's the actual number of molecules, or you can convert that to the mass of chlorophyll. You're saying that the mass of chlorophyll is related to the mass of the cells. And, you know, do you mean mass as in like actual mass of carbon or mass of all the material, or do you mean the biovolume of the cells? Just Keep track of your proxies, because it's a, there's a lot of assumption in each one of those. Okay, phycoerythrin fluorescence could be a proxy for phycoerythrin concentration, or cyanobacterial biomass, if it's the, say, synecococcus, or something that has phycoerythrin, right? Um, CDOM fluorescence is a proxy for CDOM. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I mean, it's funny, but really what this is, is FDOM. The fluorescent, oops, I'm trapped. The fluorescent dissolved organic matter um, is a proxy for CDOM, which is the absorption, which is color dissolved organic matter, right? So not everything that absorbs fluoresces. So you can think about dissolved organic matter. Some fraction of that is carbon. Some fraction of that absorbs, so that's sedum, and some fraction of that fluoresces. So you're making the association between those two, and you're making the association between these two. Okay, so, all right. So, we can think about the fluorescence at some wavelength, maybe 683, is equal to the scalar irradiance at some excitation, maybe 440, um, times the absorption by the chlorophyll at that wavelength, uh, times some fluorescence efficiency that um, converts the absorbed energy to fluoresced. Okay, yes. We're starting with the simplest equation, and we're going to make approximations for either of them. Okay, so first we're going to do in vitro. Now, I've used this term before, 
I did not make this up. But they use the term psi for an efficiency factor. It isn't the radiant power that I talked about earlier last week. It's a fluorescence efficiency factor. Okay. So this is the a scalar spectral light. It has units. Uh, you could do watts or quanta, but because we're talking about quantized energy, I'm going to use quanta. Um, the chlorophyll absorption coefficient is also spectral, but we're going to look at it at some um, particular wavelength of excitation as units of per meter. The fluorescence efficiency, also called the quantum efficiency, is just the ratio of how, many, how, how much quanta gets fluoresced compared to how much was absorbed. Right? Is it 3%? Is it 5%? Is it 10%? Um, and so then we can figure out what our units are on F. So we've got micromoles of quanta per meter squared per second times per meter times quanta fluoresced over quanta absorbed. So it turns out the, you know, the quanta, um, the scalar times absorption is going to give you, this is going to give you the quanta absorbed. So we'll be able to cancel that out, that quanta. And so we end up with the quanta fluoresced per cubic meter per second. Okay. So as Ken said, the fluorescence emission is isotropic. It comes out equally in all directions from either the molecule or from the suspension, the solution, or from the cell. And so if we look at this ex equation and we look at the magnitude of chlorophyll fluorescence versus the light, the excitation scalar irradiance, and let's say that we have kept the concentration of chlorophyll constant, so its absorption is constant, and let's say that the efficiency factor is constant. For every amount of additional light we excite with, we'll get more fluorescence. Check? Check. Okay. Now, if we do the same thing and we say, okay, well, we can control the amount of light, and we're going to vary the concentration of the molecule, then the fluorescence will increase linearly with the concentration. Check. So this is like starting to make us think like this is great. It's a great proxy because we can control for e either one of these things. Yeah. So it, it is variable in nature. It's not as variable if it's a solution of chlorophyll molecules in a solvent. Give me a second and we'll, we'll start to see this, okay? Hold on just a sec. Yeah. All right. So we can um, assume some constants if in our fluorometer. And so we're going to have chlorophyll in solution. Uh, they have a constant mass specific absorption coefficient. It looks like this. So one um, milligram of chlorophyll will have this absorption. Two milligrams of chlorophyll will have twice that. But if we divide by the mass, we can get a mass specific absorption. We have a constant quantum yield for these molecules. And so our good sensors can maintain a constant light source or we can monitor it and correct for it. And so we can end up with this really nice calibration of fluorescence versus extracted chlorophyll. And that was what people did for the bench top fluorometer. That's how we came up with those calibration coefficients that you guys used. Okay, you just use a standard chlorophyll solution. So that's really straightforward. So the problem is, once we get into the cell, then physiology takes over. So phytoplankton absorb light in their light harvesting complexes. And these are proteins embedded into membranes that are the thylakoid membranes that are then stacked in the chloroplasts, and then the chloroplasts are in the cell. And these light harvesting complexes um, have these pigments sort of wrapped around um, a reaction center where photosynthesis occurs. And so you get absorption by any one of these pigments, and the energy gets transferred. And that energy transfer is very efficient. Um, so there's a little bit of energy loss when you have, say, a chlorophyll molecule absorbing in the blue. 
maybe you have a fucoxanthin absorbing in the green, and the energy transfer from this absorption to this absorption is relatively efficient. And it's, um, there's an adjacency between these pigments, and there's like a physical vibrational transfer of energy. So there's very little energy lost. And so by the time the energy sort of gets funneled into this reaction center, we're down here at this part of the spectrum. Okay. So um, you can have these antenna pigments absorb. Maybe chlorophyll absorbs in the blue there. The other carotenoids, they can absorb either green light coming down or they can receive energy from the blue absorption by chlorophyll as it transfers. Um, and all of that energy goes to the center where photosynthesis is going to occur. But that is where fluorescence occurs. Fluorescence occurs here. So all of the energy from all the pigments is funneling, in, funneling into the reaction center. And then it goes and does photosynthesis. Okay. So the, the uh, cells want to put as much energy as possible towards photosynthesis. That's the preferred pathway. Um, however, they can only process energy at a certain rate. There's a, like a maximum rate that they can use absorbed energy um, in the light reactions to begin um, the photosynthetic process. They lose a lot of energy to heat and the excess energy can go to fluorescence. There's a couple of other pathways that are um, kind of caught up in the heat part. So of some of that absorbed energy going into photosynthesis means that it's energy not going into fluorescence and we're measuring fluorescence, um, which is really what the cells you know, are trying to get rid of. It's the, really their byproduct. But that loss of absorbed energy to photosynthesis is called photochemical quenching. It's the energy that went into photochemistry or photosynthesis, okay? The loss of absorbed energy to heat it can occur on a variety of different time scales and each process has its own time scale. And that energy also is not going into photosynthesis or fluorescence. Some of that loss of energy can be reversible and some of it can cause permanent damage. This is where we start talking about non-photochemical quenching of fluorescence. So we have a reduction in fluorescence caused by too much absorption and the loss of energy as heat and not fluorescence. Yes? So could I think of photochemical quenching as, if you go back to the last slide, the bouncing from antenna to reaction center or where? The energy that actually made it in here and went into fixing carbon. That's photochemical quenching of fluorescence. So could, could you visualize that as like as it goes across, or is that more of a? Yeah. So there's heat loss. So there's absorption and heat loss and energy transfer, mm -hmm. and then you get here, and some of the energy goes into photosynthesis. Some of it gets fluoresced, and the stuff that doesn't get fluoresced that goes into photosynthesis is photochemical quenching of fluorescence. But it would be both in the yes. The quenching. Is Quenching is a loss to fluorescence, not a loss to the cell. The cell is actually wanting to do photosynthesis. So it has to do with how you think about what the cell is trying to do versus what we're measuring. And what we're measuring is what's left over from what the cell is trying to do its business, make a living. Yeah, Emmanuel. If I understand correctly, there's two photosystems. Yes. In many yes. And one fluorescence and one Right. It is. So not all the yes. That are in, the cell would in, in fluorescence. And that's part of where the efficiency starts to get messy. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we have the same old equation, but now we're in a cell. So we can still hold our light constant because we're good engineers, right? Now, instead of having absorption just by a chlorophyll molecule, we have to consider the absorption by the phytoplankton, which is comprised of a variety of different pigments, the energy of which transfers through to photosynthesis and to the reaction center, which also means it goes to fluorescence by the reaction center. Mm 
uh, people look at, well, yeah, I think I'm going to show this for a second. And then we also have this, now the efficiency factor is really variable because a lot of different processes are happening in the cell that can quench fluorescence compared to energy absorbed. They can do photosynthesis, it can go to heat and non-photochemical quenching. Um, so because the chlorophyll is bound to proteins and bound in membranes and connected to other pigments, there's a lot of other physiological pathways. And that means that the quantum yield is really variable. The good rule of thumb, and I think, Kurt, do you use 3%? Do you use 3% for fluorescence uh, efficiency? The is two. Two? You can set it to whatever you want. Because two is the average of one in three, is why yeah, I think no. it's, yeah, I think it's in there. Yeah, but recognize that the fluorescence, there's a lot more quenching at noon than there is at dawn, because the light is higher. And so non-photochemical quenching can change this um, to be much larger. Um, we also have to think about this mass-specific phytoplankton absorption. So when we measured, did you guys calculate specific absorption when we did absorption measurements and you had chlorophyll measurements? Okay, so you can go back and look at your data. New assignment. You have the absorption by phytoplankton, right, which you guys measured on the filter pad. And you have some beautiful spectrum that has some value to it, absorption per meter. But you also have a chlorophyll concentration for that, for that sample, right? So if you divide by the chlorophyll concentration, it's going to change the units here. Um, and the units, of course, are um, meters to the minus one for absorption, and then for chlorophyll, it's milligrams per meter cubed, which then I can put the meter cubed up here. So it's going to go to meter squared per milligram of chlorophyll. Well, if you do this for a variety of different samples, you'll find that there's some variation in there, depending upon your phytoplankton. But, you know, what's a factor of two or three between friends? So you could come up with a nice average spectrum that would represent all of the phytoplankton in the world, and then that could go in here. And then, um, if you call that constant, then you can say the fluorescence by your chlorophyll is proportional to your chlorophyll. Because we maintain a constant light source, we measure fluorescence in relative units, um, but what we have to do is calibrate it. So we're kind of assuming that this is relatively constant, so we can relate this to the concentration, which then we have to like, you know, think about it in terms of taking the sample and extracting the chlorophyll. So if that's true, and we come up with some linear relationship between the fluorescence that we measure in the cell and the chlorophyll of that cell suspension, now we can use our fluorometers for living cells. So how bad can this be? And this gets back to Mortimer's question is like, what is this factor here? Well, it varies by a factor of three, <laughs> right? It's a small number, but it's a small number that has a lot of variability in terms of a multiplier. Okay, so now if we're doing this fluorescence yield, which is the fluorescence per chlorophyll, and now we're trying to calibrate our fluorometer for a living culture. Well, it depends on the chlorophyll molecule being packaged in the chloroplast. And here's some beautiful diatoms. These ones look like they're growing under high light. They don't have that many chloroplasts. But now imagine it's low light and they're packed with chloroplasts. Right, so that's gonna change the packaging and it's gonna change the absorption. It's gonna change the fluorescence. And so you could end up with a variety of different slopes between the fluorescence that you measured and the chlorophyll you extracted, depending upon your phytoplankton. And that's just one species, because you're changing how the optical properties on the cellular basis in both absorption and fluorescence. Okay. But it gets better, because we don't just have one species of phytoplankton. We have a variety of different species of phytoplankton. And each one of them is shaped differently and has different absorption spectra different pigments, different packaging, different sizes. Even from me modeling, you can imagine how 
this, the efficiency of absorption changes between all of these different phytoplankton. So now the fluorescence that you measure from a mixture of phytoplankton versus the response, you can have a, a huge range. Okay. How huge is huge? Well, we'll see. All right. So here's a bunch of different fluorometers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have more chlorophyll. If you have, if this is lower, this, this, is that what you're saying? This specific absorption? Mm -hmm. If it's lower, mm -hmm. okay. I have big cells. Yep. A more package effect. Yep. And less as low. Yeah, so if you have a big cell that has lots of stuff in here, your absorption per chlorophyll is going to go down. Okay. What do you think your fluorescence is going to do? So if you're shining a light on it and you're looking for light coming out from maybe the chloroplast over here, but there's all these other chloroplasts in front, the efficiency of that particular chloroplast to absorption and fluorescence is also going to go down, uh -huh. right? But then you take this cell and you put it in a test tube to extract and get its chlorophyll concentration and you add up all of the chlorophyll molecules, which is going to be a lot. <laughs> so then you're going to be down here. You're going to have a low response. You have a lot of chlorophyll, but a low response. So this can be thought of as you know, in part packaging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So if you have a sample of like phytoplankton and you are, you are looking at the peak of the fluorescence of them, mm -hmm. I was wondering if the peak would be like flatter rather than just sharp. Uh, it's not as sharp as just chlorophyll because you have other pigments that can play a role here. It depends. So one of the things when we measure the fluorescence in a cuvette, we can keep it pretty thin. But absolutely, you can begin to see flattening if you're measuring it in the water and it's really thick phytoplankton. Like a, a bloom, you can get some flattening. And so the efficiency will also, can also sort of maybe start off like this and then taper off a little bit if you were increasing the concentration to be so high that there's reabsorption. Yeah. Um, why is it that in this uh, um, equation, the one that they use, we have no particular wavelength that we are looking at? For the previous one, we had. Oh, like yes. So I could excite which whatever wavelength I want, right? <laughs> Be so you could excite it for 40. But now that you actually have, and I'm going to get to this, but now that you actually have pigments here that can absorb light and transfer it to the reaction center and therefore for fluorescence, you can excite at different wavelengths. Yeah. Um, I'll get there in a sec. Not a sec. Seven minutes. <laughs> I don't know. Something like that. All right. So here are a bunch of different fluorometers. How many people have worked with the Chelsea? No one's worked with the Chelsea. Trios? Worked with the Trios? Okay, good. Anyone else? No? Turner Designs? Couple, one person in the back, two people in the back, three, four, okay. What about the wet labs? Okay, more people there. All right. They're all the same. I mean, they're not all the same, but basically, they're all very similar. So they provide some excitation, flux of energy, usually in the blue. And they measure the emission, usually at something greater than 695 nanometers. They put a filter in to block everything else. And they measure sort of a broad, a broad band of emission. Um, each one requires calibration, although they all show up with a calibration, right? And if you really want to know some terrible things, ask them how they calibrate uh, their sensors. OK, because that's what's going from volts to milligrams per meter cubed. And so um, I always calibrate my own. But um, yeah, so I already took that poll. All right, so for those of you who have worked with fluorometers or with fluorescence data, you get your fluorometer back fresh. It's freshly calibrated. 
you um, then go out and you make a bunch of measurements, you collect discrete samples because you're told you need to validate, and you plot it, and you get this. <laughs> so I was handed this data set about uh, well over a decade ago, actually like, I don't know, 20 years ago or something crazy, one of my first contracts. It was from the Massachusetts Water Resource Authority, which is responsible for figuring out how the then new um, sewage outfall into Boston Harbor was influencing bacteria, or phytoplankton growth through nutrients. So they went out and they made tons and tons of measurements of fluorescence. They ca captured lots, well, a thousand water samples and then got this relationship. And I was like, what do you want? It's, you know, you increase your chlorophyll Increase your fluorescence, you increase your chlorophyll. It's just, you know, it's really messy. So, huh? It's <laughs> surprisingly not that much better. <laughs> so, you know, they paid me for, you know, a couple of years to figure out what the problem was. So, um, yeah, so it's a bunch of different things. So, here's one of the problems. How do we get from volts to milligrams per meter cubed? Well, you have to have a standard. And a lot of companies use a solid standard. And it looks like a glow stick. If you buy a wet lab's fluorometer, they give you an orange glow stick and you hold it in front of that and it's like, oh yay, it fluoresces. Um, but they had to convert it back to chlorophyll at some point in the past. And I know that they were using a single culture, a single dilution from the 80s, um, measured by a person who was not a phytoplankton ecologist. And that was the calibration for one of the company's um, calibration coefficients. Um, so you could also calibrate it with chlorophyll and extract, just like we do the benchtop fluorometer. The problem is, this is the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll and extract. This is a phytoplankton absorption spectrum. This is wavelength. Um, note that the solvent results, putting it in solvent results in a big shift in the peaks. So if you're trying to relate it ultimately to the blue curve, calibrating it to the green curve is not so great. Um, the other problem is that they tend to use wavelength, excitation wavelengths at 470 nanometers. And chlorophyll in extract does not absorb there at all. So in fact, 470 is not really stimulating chlorophyll absorption. It's stimulating absorption by the accessory pigments, right? So it means that we can't use an actual standard to calibrate these fluorometers. So, um, right, so what do we do? Well, you can calibrate it to a culture. And so you want to find a culture that's traceable. So um, one approach is to get something that's easy to culture. So here's a variety of, um, Kurt showed you this before. I grew these cultures. This is from out in the other lab when I used to work here. And these are all grown to way, way high concentrations to show you the beautiful range of color and pigmentation. But say you pick this one. It's easy to culture. It's the kind of species that you find throughout the world, or, or at least the genus. Um, it has robust optical properties. Um, the one I selected was the Lassia cyrosudinana. It's a diatom. And I grow it under very constrained conditions. And I use that to do a calibration on my fluorometers. And I do it year after year after year. And I measure its pigment concentration and its absorption spectrum and the size distribution and its carbon concentration so that I can make sure that each year the culture is the same. And it's remarkably robust, which is kind of crazy. Um, but you know, cells optimize themselves. So then we would create a dilution series. And here is just a, a serial dilution of this culture. And then you would measure the fluorescence response. Um, we use a big dark container so that we're not contaminated by other light. We called it a casket. Um, I think, Emmanuel, did you design the casket? Giorgio. Giorgio did. Former student designed this casket. Um, and it just, it traps scattered light. And then you measure the fluorescence response and you hope you get a line, right? And again, these are living, this is a living culture. Um, and then for each of your dilutions, you extract it. Each sample you filter and extract. All right, great. So then you do a linear regression. I do a type two because I have, since I have triplicates, I've got error in this direction and then I have error in my measurement. And you come up with some slope. 
which is your fluorescence to chlorophyll, and sometimes called the fluorescence yield. And in this case, your 